I am still a server noob, but after building my first uh, server rack here and just kind of learning as I go, I want to take things a step further. And it involves this machine right here. Boy, oh boy, is she dusty. Pardon me while I make a fool of myself trying to pull this thing out. Oh boy. Ugh, careful. Oh gosh. Whew. So this here is Aldebron, and you probably saw us build it in an earlier video. She's admittedly just been chilling in the server rack doing nothing because I haven't actually gotten around to making this video. Where we'll be able to really allow her to stretch her legs a bit. We've got the latest and greatest hardware in here, including a Ryzen 9 7950X 3D and an RTX 4090 Founders Edition. Very beefy power supply, plenty of RAM. This thing's just ready to game. But a lot of you are confused why we threw gaming hardware into a server chassis. Well, that's why this video exists. We're gonna be trying to set up some sort of off-site gaming rig, so to speak, where we could, in theory, game with this machine anywhere in the world, as long as we have a stable internet connection. It'll probably be laggy, but will it still be playable? That's what I wanna find out in this video. We certainly have the hardware to do it. I'm just not sure if we have the bandwidth or the, the servers on the back end, on Steam side or what have you, to pull this off. Let's find out. Are you ready? Stay with me. If you're planning your next PC build, then consider checking out our sponsor, VIP SCD Key. Their Windows 10 and 11 OEM keys sell for a fraction of retail and will unlock the full potential of your OS. And during their May sale, you can snag them for 30% off using our promo code GSVIP. Simply click the link below, select buy now, and pay with a secure payment method like PayPal. At checkout, don't forget our code, again, GSVIP, and watch us 30% ripped right off the top, bringing Windows 10 down to 15 bucks and Windows 11 to 20 21. Then hop over to the user center and click view keys slash codes. And there you have it, a genuine OEM Windows key that'll lock to your combination of hardware. Be sure to stick around till later though, when we'll show you how to activate Windows with said key. In the meantime, check out those links below and don't forget to use GSVIP to save 30%. <laughs> you don't have to say that again. What time is it right now? It's like 11 o'clock. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock. No, 10. 10.45, so uh, she's up here crashing with me. While I work on this project that is uh, really dirty, there's a lot of dust. We need to clean this before we do anything else. Do you, do you want to clean it? No. I'm, okay, I'm kidding, okay, I'm, I'm kidding, all right? I, it's my mess, I gotta clean it up. No, but seriously though, do you want to clean it? And to think that was only after three months, sheesh. Now there are a few housekeeping items to take care of apart from cleaning before we can game on all the brawn. Firstly, we need to add more storage because while well, all of our games that we want to stream have to be physically on this machine, in order to work. And that's where Western Digital have come to the rescue with their WD Red SN 700s here. These are NVMe drives, two terabytes of pop. We're gonna run these in RAID 1 for redundancy. So all of our games are gonna be stored and mirrored on both of these drives. So in the event one of these fails, we don't have to reinstall games from scratch. They aren't a sponsor of this video. In fact, I reached out to them directly with regards to this project. They were happy to send both of these out. So. Big shout out to Western Digital. These are gonna be linked below if you're interested. Now, if you recall, I have Proxmox loaded in this machine. We'll have to mount both of the drives within that environment and then set up Windows virtualization for Steam. I'll be using my own personal Steam account. And you can see we have three extra M.2 slots here. It's one of the reasons why I'm glad I swapped to this board. In we go with each and uh, toolless locking, which is quite convenient for this board. Just lower it twist this little locking mechanism, and there we go. We'll do the same for drive number two. Cover with thermal pads is going back on and just four Phillips screws to finish it off. Now this chunky thing is going back in. Nice and careful now. These are still super, super expensive. That's more like it. So a bit cleaner, more storage, and the rest of what we're about to do will take place in software. First things first, creating a ZFS RAID on both of the newly installed NVMEs. Easy enough within Proxmox, which we installed in our previous server video. If you're interested, I'll have that linked below. By configuring a RAID 1 here, our Windows VM should see a single viable drive for Steam games. In fact, we can even have multiple Windows VMs tapping into the same game library, although whether or not this can be done at the same time is uh, still above my pay grade, just something to point out. Gigabyte's virtualization settings in this board's BIOS were a bit convoluted, had to enable it in 2.0. 
two separate places, which was a bit, uh, yeah, it's just bizarre. I've never seen that before. And the second toggle only showed up as an option after enabling the first, but once we figured it out, we were able to load into our VM, install pass-through drivers, and finally, the OS onto our desired drive. Now getting a VM to understand how to use a graphics card properly can be a bit jarring for first timers like myself, but we were eventually able to see our RTX 4090 within Windows and install appropriate drivers. This tiny tool came in super handy by the way, as it essentially acted as a fake video out to trick our graphics card into enabling modern resolutions. Since access to our VM up to this point has been via the local network, we haven't had to rely on a physical HDMI or DisplayPort connection. However, for gaming, we'll need our card to think we have a monitor connected in order to run games at desirable resolutions and refresh rates. We learned this the hard way. Setting this all up also required the use of remote desktop and team viewer. And from what I've learned so far, it wouldn't be a bad idea to keep something like team viewer running in the background of your VM at all times, should something go wrong while you're out of the office. And finally, from there, I was able to open up things like 3D Mark Time Spy and GTA 5 via remote desktop to confirm that everything happening locally on the VM and within Aldebaran itself was healthy and consistent. But here is where the real test begins. See, Steam has this thing called Remote Play that allows users to stream gameplay from a host machine to any other machine with a stable internet connection and access to the same Steam account. This could be via a second PC, a laptop, or even cell phone if you're able to download the Steam Link app. And as far as I'm aware, there are two types of streaming that Steam supports. I'm gonna get Steam and Stream confused a lot in this next section, just bear with me. One involves what Steam calls direct connection, ergo streaming from one device to another within the same local network. This should in theory eliminate the need for traffic to bounce off of Steam servers and this would reduce latency as a result. Uh, that is gonna be the desirable choice. If you can help it, it's better just to stream in general within your local network to reduce that latency. And many in forums seem to back up this experience with their own input lag and latency impressions. Steam also has a toggle within their mobile app called Direct Connection that I believe is used for the same purpose. Just make sure that this is either set to automatic or enabled. I was able to load up GTA 5 on my iPhone 15 and play with literally zero issues. Everything was extremely smooth. The frame rate was solid thanks to our overkill hardware combo within Aldebaran. And latency, to my surprise, was virtually non existent. Now, I don't have equipment suited for measuring input lag in real time, but the gamer in me wasn't much offended by what I was seeing. I probably wouldn't want to play a competitive first person shooter this way, I mean, especially on mobile with quirky, you know, inputs, but most anything else should be more than satisfactory. Racing games, city builders, RPGs, MOBAs, they should all be doable. However, the moment you step outside your local network, this is where things are going to probably change. Now, your gaming traffic can no longer be streamed directly from machine to machine, right? And more than likely, you'll be running off of, say, a Wi-Fi connection rather than wired LAN. In fact, you could even stream off of cell towers but it's gonna look something like this unless you have a very strong upload speed. I mean, usually the downloads over cell towers are pretty fine, but uploads can suffer quite a bit. So um, if, I mean, if you wanna deal with this, be my guest. It was pretty bad both in GTA 5 and in Starfield, so it really had nothing to do with the game being played. Again, our hardware is overkill on Aldebaran, but the network itself, the, the connection to Steam servers was not fantastic. And so, uh, yeah, your mileage is gonna vary there. I wouldn't recommend cell tower gaming. If you could find just a solid Wi-Fi connection, that should be enough. The best situation is gonna be a wired connection. If you can find a desktop that's plugged directly into a wall with decent downloads and uploads, you're gonna be perfectly fine. But you might be thinking, well, Greg, that, that latency could increase dramatically where we have to bounce off of those servers, right? And in any case where you're not local, you'll be utilizing Steam servers. This is at least what I imagine is happening behind the scenes. I'm not sure how else it would work. But to my surprise, playback was actually pretty decent. I took my 13-inch MacBook with me to my parents' house, which is about 30, 40 miles away. There was a slight delay that became more noticeable in fast pace settings, like driving cars or flying planes, but I actually felt confident in my movements over. I could probably play this online without issue. I mean, it reminded me a bit of gaming on like an older TV before many manufacturers made accommodations for input lag. So if you aren't looking for it, you probably won't notice, though anyone who's accustomed to high-end monitors will definitely call it out. Combine this with the fact that you'll likely be playing on well, unorthodox hardware, <laughs> a MacBook like this or some other non-gaming laptop or a cell phone, 
and you may decide it isn't worth it at all. Though I've got to say, playing GTA 5 on an Apple device is pretty darn cool. I can play virtually any game now on my Mac Studio. I'm sure you're wondering where that's gone since our 30-day Apple experiment a few months ago. It's still here next to my current Windows setup and still sees a lot of use today. Now I can see even more because of remote play. Whereas before, this machine was only limited to a select few games in the Steam library, and it ran those impressively, mind you, on native M hardware, nothing can really compete with the likes of a 7950X 3D and RTX 4090, even streamed over a local network, both of which allow me to fully saturate up to a 4K panel, mind you, at either 60 or 120 hertz. And that is more than most remote devices will ever need. But still, the headroom is nice. Just make sure to enable these settings within Steam, give or take, you know, a few here or there. I've been happy with this config as is if you want to copy this verbatim. Maybe if uh, you have, you know, slightly weaker hardware on your host machine, drop things to 1080p, maybe 60 hertz. But still, this opens a ton of doors to play other games you otherwise wouldn't be able to on those other devices. GTA 5, of course, looks nice. We've shown a lot of that already. Racing games like Dirt 5 are a breeze. Titles like Starfield look absolutely gorgeous. And first and third person shooters are, well, okay. They're a bit clunky on mobile and, uh, <laughs> Sometimes they're blocked out completely by developers for VM and anti-cheat detection systems, but this isn't the fault of Steam nor Aldebron. In reality, there are so many games in Steam's library that are perfectly suited for mobile streaming, you likely won't be complaining. You just may need to tweak your button layout a bit, especially on mobile, but the fact that you can even use a laptop or another desktop anywhere in the world by simply signing into your Steam account is a pretty cool prospect. Also, this isn't new by any means. Steam's had this support for years, in case you're wondering. I'm just now in a position where I'm able to set up a dedicated streaming machine in a ventilated and isolated section of my house with a great networking setup thanks to companies like Ubiquity. Much of what you're seeing here would not be possible without them, so huge shout. I'll have some of their stuff linked below. Now, quick pivot back to what we were talking about earlier regarding Proxmox and VMs. You don't have to have any of this running to get your Steam Remote Play linking up and running. You could use just a, a regular Windows desktop and get by without having to deal with any of this other Linux distro Proxmox crap. If it's not your cup of tea, just install Windows, install Steam, and just make sure that the PC never turns off. In fact, this solution might work better than what I've done, depending on the titles you have in mind, because games like The Finals, for example, won't flag a VM for anti-cheat, and you likely won't have any finicky sign-in issues like we've had when first setting things up. You won't even need the fake display out connector to trick your graphics card, because what does it matter? Just turn on the match resolution within Steam's remote play settings to whatever native monitor you're using. But whether you're running a VM or bare metal, you probably want to activate Windows, and it's exactly what we're going to do here. So if you've already gotten a key from VIP SCD key, your next step should be to copy said key and navigate to the Activation tab within Windows Settings. You can get there quickly by typing Activate in your Search tab and clicking Enter. From here, click Change or Add Product Key, paste your code, and allow Windows to run its checks. And then click Activate. Give it a minute and you should notice your watermark disappear along with a message that Windows has been successfully activated. If you're having issues with your key, triple check that you've entered it correctly and that it corresponds to your version of Windows. VIP SCD keys may sale, won't be here much longer, so be sure to snag a key or two before it's too late and be sure to use my special offer code again, GSVIP, for a sweet discount on a variety of options including Windows 10, Windows 11, and more. I know this is a lot and can seem a bit overwhelming, but there are tons of guides online again, and I've been kind of learning as I go here. I'm definitely not a guru, which is why I'm not framing this necessarily as a tutorial. Maybe sometime in the future when I'm more confident in explaining this stuff, I could revisit it. But I just wanted to show you what's possible here. And again, you don't need crazy elaborate hardware. Heck, even your primary machine, so long as you keep it up and running and don't allow it to power off or hibernate and you keep steam running in the background, could serve as your host machine for remote gaming pretty much anywhere in the world. It's obviously going to be Steam limited because, well, this is Steam's remote play we're talking about that makes most of this possible, but there are also third-party solutions that essentially do the same thing. You can easily match native resolutions on your streaming devices up to 4K and above in cases and allow for up to 120 hertz playback simultaneously. Best of all, said devices won't consume battery life at an exorbitant rate since your host machine, presumably plugged into an outlet, will be doing all of the heavy lifting back home. It's honestly a great option for those who either don't have gaming laptops, say you aren't interested in first-person shooters, 
or who dabble in the Apple ecosystem like I do. Heck, even with a cheap, tiny PC like this one, for example, we could in theory turn any screen in any room into a gaming machine, provided we're okay with remote plays limitations and we're on a stable network. I think that's pretty cool. It's certainly not perfect, but it's come a long way over the past few years, and that's why I'm confident enough to, to make this video to show you that I'm actually using it myself. Not all the time, of course. I'm still going to prefer 10 times out of 10 using my local machine to game with, but if I don't really have another option or I don't want to lug a large gaming laptop around or maybe I just am super, I don't know, stubborn and don't want to get rid of my Apple products, then this is an alternative, and it's a pretty darn good one at that. Most of us already have Steam anyways, and Remote Play is baked into that, so it doesn't require any additional, like, crazy setup time, no third-party software unless you really want it, and that is nice. That's one of the reasons why I was able to do this despite the noob that I am. If you have any feedback, any comment suggestions, leave those in the comment section below, especially for videos like these. I do appreciate that constructive criticism. Uh, if you have uh, just helpful tips, things that could steer me in the right direction, I will say that I have noticed that the gameplay is a lot smoother, even locally, if I drop the resolution. Just something to note, uh, streaming in 4K 120 is a lot more difficult, a lot more taxing bandwidth wise than it is at you know 1080p 60, for example. So if 1080p 60 is all you need, that should be perfectly fine, especially if you're gaming remotely or if you're gaming over cell service, which is a last resort. And you guys saw that wasn't the, the best experience, but it is an option. Comment down below, leave a like, consider subscribing, and uh, I'll catch you in the next one. You guys haven't seen the behind the scenes of this video, but it took about two good weeks, was it two good weeks, Raymond, to film? And it's just because we were trying to work things out. The VM side of things really complicated it. If you just wanted to stick with Windows and uh, you know, a bare metal situation, so to speak, I uh, think that's gonna be much easier, much more approachable for the average consumer. So I'm gonna get out of here again. Thanks for watching and thanks for learning with me.